So our first reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 2 and 10 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me in to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God. I rejoice heartily in the Lord. In my God is the joy of my soul, for he has clothed me with a robe of salvation, for he has clothed, wrapped me in a mantle of justice, like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem, like a bride bedecked with her jewels, as the earth brings forth its plants and a garden makes its growth spring up. So will the Lord God make justice and praise spring up before all the nations. Our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 1, 39 through 45 and 57 through 66. At the time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But am I so favored that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. His mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. <laughs> they said to her, there was no one among our relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out that he would like the name to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard his wonder about it, asking, when is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. Now let's hear from the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg. Secrets of Heaven, number five, Five one one. It is similar the case when the internal or those living in their natural declare that the joy experienced by the angels originates in love to the Lord and the charity towards the neighbor. That is to say, when they are actually engaged in performing deeds of love and charity and that these deeds hold within them so much joy and so much happiness and these are beyond description. This will come as a hard idea to those whose joy springs solely from self-love and love of the world and who take no interest in their neighbor other than for their own selfish reasons. Yet heaven and heavenly joy to exist in a person when self-regard vanishes from the useful deeds he performs. <clears throat> so the name of this sermon is Bringing Joy to Our Neighbor. And I would just want to start with a small invocation. The divine nature of any one of us in the divine hands of our Lord, our maker, we await. We are alert and we are ready. We entertain the wonder, passion, and curious, curiosity of the season. And as grace appears, may we enter anew. Isaiah comes to us He's the anointed one. It is when the Spirit of the Lord has given his blessing on Isaiah in our reading today 
and he sits in the biblical text as a major prophet. <laughs> he knows when the Lord is speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon, them, upon me. The Lord has anointed me. And when he announces to bring glad tidings to the poor, this season is all about it, right? We bring tidings. We make our cookies. We hear glad tidings of comfort and joy. We lit the third candle, the candle of joy. Isaiah is writing from the 8th century. The phenomena of prophecy is widespread in the ancient East at that time. It is a time when the oracles are written down. Isaiah prophesizes the coming of the Lord, and we can hear his story, and we can hear the story today. Isaiah prophesizes um, that deep message. As we listen to the story, we see that Isaiah is writing when there's a lot of division and community in the community and a lot of upheaval. That sounds familiar. We could easily use much of the historical context for the reading of the 21st century, and it would fit just like a glove, proclaiming the liberty to the captives, releasing to the prisoners. In the reading, Isaiah announces favor from the Lord. He sees that the Lord God will bring justice and praise before all nations. We are living the story in our own hearts today, and I want to say Isaiah heralds the time. He proclaims the story well before this day and age. Through all the division and challenge of that time, Isaiah rejoices. He doesn't just rejoice, but he heartily rejoices. He, he brings and it shares it to the people of God. In my God is joy, he states. God moves and stirs Isaiah, just like he moves in each of us. We are reminded during this Advent season to be ready in this season, we see the love surrounding us. We see Isaiah and how he lights the way for the, door, the day the Lord is born. The ancient sounds of the word bring about a, a strong sense of what is true and good. Our historic relationships and heritage of oral cultures are spiritually sounding the way and reminded, reminding us to share that joy, to share that hope and goodness. Isaiah reminds us of taking care of the other, feeding the poor, heal the brokenhearted, and bring charity to our neighbor. The Hebrew word for, for neighbor is ra. I kind of had to think twice when I, ra. <laughs> so I felt this idea of that sound, it reverberates as a tone language that harbors a sense of other worlds. The word Ra, or neighbor, appears in the Old Testament 188 times. 63 of those times is about shepherding. The shepherd watches over its sheep, the lambs, the innocent one. To take care of the neighbor or the other is about shepherding one another. When we ask the question, who is the neighbor, we can look at the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg. Emanuel Swedenborg states in the New Jerusalem that everyone is our neighbor, whether large or small. The actions that motivate us must be motivated by love. Isaiah is experiencing this deep joy, this deep wonder inside of that divine experience of the anointed one that he has been given by the Lord. It must come from the internal, Emanuel Swedenborg declares that declare of joy, that deeper part of us, and just then we can feel that heavenly love. The Old Testament's essential meaning of the neighbor, or Ra, is all about relationships. We read in the Gospel of Luke today, the physician, that blessed physician of ours, and he talks about the divine joy of Mary and Elizabeth, their meeting, they share the story of the angels. They want to share, but he first says, Mary's getting ready. She hurries to a town in the hill country. As I read this story, I was reminded of a recent trip in April this year. A group of us went to Israel through the tour of the Center for Swedenborgian Studies. It was profoundly a reflective trip and a great tour. 
We heard stories of Israel's neighbors and our Palestine neighbors. The tension we experienced stirred in most of us. Both communities had something to say about the other, and the divisions were great. Praying for both of these neighbors was helpful. Walking in the Holy Land deepened my heart and how we must learn to care for our neighbor. We visited many villages and places where Jesus did his ministry. While there, we went to a small town west of Jerusalem called Ein Karim, a hillside town. Ein Karim is said to have been where the birth of John the Baptist was born. After visiting a well with the group and blessing, blessing um, ourselves with the water, there was a beautiful well, and blessing ourselves, my husband and I, Ian, went off on our own. We walked in the forest, Beautiful flowers were in bloom. We can see the flowers in the chapel today. We can take a moment and sense that. We walked in the Holy Land and deepened my heart and how we must learn to care for that neighbor, including our natural neighbor. We visited many villages, and I just want to say, as we were, we were walking in that forest, up on the hill was a chapel. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. I was strongly attracted to go. So I said to Ian, can we go? And it was up a steep hill. But so many visitors. There, Ein Karim gets three million visitors a year. So there we went. We arrived at the church of visitation where Mary and Elizabeth met. This is the place where they met. And this is where the baby jumped and leaped in Elizabeth's womb. As we walked in, this mural, and I've asked Tira to take, take it and pass it out to you, was up on the wall. And anybody online, maybe you can hold up for one online just for a second. There should be enough that pass around. Up on the hill, <coughs> you know, we, say, we see that Mary and child uh, Mary went to visit Elizabeth. As we walked in, I just felt this moment of time. And if you can just take a minute, we'll just take a silent moment and just look at the picture. God speaks to us in these holy places. This mural took up a whole wall. It was just so stunning. The sensorial expression of love leaped off the wall into my heart. As I looked around the chapel, I saw a group of women theologians on all the windows, which is really rare today. And I was, I was so touched. I could not wait to share this picture to our group, and especially my professor, Rebecca Esterson, which some of you know. She's a Swedenborgian theologian. She immediately, when she looked at the picture, she reminded me of Revelation 12, when she saw this, the woman and child clothed with the sun and standing on the moon. Emmanuel Swedenborg shares the story in Apocalypse Reveal. The woman clothed with the sun for Swedenborg represents a new hope and a way of engaging with the spirit. And we always open to new ways, new guidance and love from the Lord. I found myself asking, what was Mary thinking after she heard the angel Gabriel? Why does Mary hurry off to the hillside? She might have been asking, why me? She might have been wondering if Elizabeth was actually pregnant. Now it changes for me when I read the story and Mary actually visits with Elizabeth and the baby leaps with joy. Mary wanted to share that joy as much as I wanted to share this joy. And in this season, I just want to tell you that Mary shares her goodness, and I believe all of us have that familiar feeling. A familiar feeling of rich historical presence of the holy, like singing our hymns during the Advent season. Some of our songs date back to the 15th century. So in Advent season, we internalize the richness of the memories. Wendy Farley, a Christian theologian from the San Francisco Theological Seminary, where I graduated, where I went, 
now called the University of Redlands, writes in her new book, Beguiled by Beauty, how we can awaken to beauty by cultivating the contemplative and the compassionate heart. She writes, the gospel is living and moving, and we must reforge that message when we receive it in our own time and in our own way. She tells us how the Holy Spirit dances around each of us in our souls. It moves through time and space, weaving eternal truths into ever-changing historical moments of our lives. Today, we hear the readings of Secrets of Heaven, that if we perform the deeds of love and the charity to our neighbor, the deeds hold so much joy and happiness. One of the great gifts Swedenborg gave to all of us with his insight into his own experience, his own spiritual experience, he lived it himself. He has supported the word to be living and moving through us as we go through the season sharing experiences of love, insight and spiritual experiences maybe to your neighbor. May you leap with that deep joy. May you bring your inner self and, and may your neighbor leap with your own joy. May we shepherd one another and deepen our wonder, curiosity and passion for the other and may the world of all nations feel the peace we experience and not just rejoice, but heartily rejoice in the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna share a poem by Mary Oliver. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate, give into it. There are plenty of our lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise or not very kind at some times, and much we can never be redeemed, much can never be redeemed in our lives. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, and sometimes something happened better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely, you notice it in that instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whenever it is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made from a crumb. As I end this moment with you of my sermon, I want to share a story that happened to us just two days ago. And it's a funny story, and it's called Wonka, the movie Wonka. <laughs> we went to the movie. I had written my sermon on sharing love to the neighbor. God seems to have a sense of humor most of the time. Willy Wonka searches for the return of his mom to bring a message throughout the movie for that, that chocolate. She made chocolate for him. He finally is defended and opens his last candy bar. And from his mom, he opens it. And the last words, after sharing much with many people throughout the movie, he's disheartened, he's quite sad, he's quite drawn in. He opens the bar, and his mother, you know, the golden ticket in Willy Wonka, he opens it and it says, his mom writes a message. It's not in the chocolate. Chocolate is about sharing. So I've asked my husband to share a piece of chocolate with you all. <laughs> so <laughs> we're all prophets of our time. May we share and bring joy to the neighbor. Amen.